My name is DeWitt Godfrey. Uh, I'm a professor here in the Art and Art History Department at Colgate University. I'm currently the coordinator of our lecture and exhibition series. Um, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to the final lecture of the semester uh, in this extraordinary year. Um, um, I'd like to acknowledge with respect the Oneida Indian people on whose ancestral lands Colgate University is located. Uh, this has been a, a wild year. Um, and uh, for those for of you here on the Colgate campus, I know that we've had you know, a bit of a setback here with uh, increase in case numbers and many students in uh, close contact quarantine. Um, I just would like to tell all the students and, and our community here what an amazing job you've done. And uh, just to try to encourage you to you know, remember what we've accomplished and that we just have a few more weeks to go. So our fall arts lecture series, um, which we titled Arts in Crisis, showed how the arts and humanities can open up spaces of speculation and imagination. Spaces where people, societies, and cultures can figure things out. Working at the fertile edges and intersections of thought and disciplines. And as 2020 came, 220, excuse me, as 2020 came to its calamitous close, it feels more than ever we need art and artists to push us to imagine new configurations, reimagine social and political relations, and envision more equitable futures. For this semester, we've had an extraordinary series of uh, guest artists uh, organized by Josh McPhee under the title Graphic Liberation, Perspectives on Image Making and Political Movements. Josh is our 2021 Christian A. Johnson Endeavor Foundation Artist in Residence in the Department of Art and History at Colgate University. And as part of a multi-year engagement with students uh, in our department, but ultimately across the university as well. Josh is a designer, artist, and archivist. He's a founding member of both the Just Seeds Artist Cooperative, a decentralized group of political artists from the US, Canada, Mexico, and Interference Archive, a public collection of cultural materials produced by social movements based in Brooklyn, New York. I'd like to thank Josh and my colleagues, Lynn Schwartzer and Bryn Hatton, and Associate Provost Trish St. Ledger for their imagination and nimbleness to adapt to Josh's residency during our COVID crisis, of which I hopefully and and cautiously optimistic we are emerging from. I'd also really like to thank Angela Kowalski, Lois Wilcox, and Mark Williams in our department, and especially Sarah Curtis and Jabil Diallo, who've helped make this series possible. This evening, um, we're very pleased to welcome Melanie Cervantes and Jesus Barraza. Melanie Cervantes and Jesus Barraza co-founded Dignidad, Dig, excuse me, Dignidad Rebelled, in 20, 2007, a graphic arts collaboration that produces screen prints, political posters, and multimedia projects which are grounded in the third world and indigenous movements that build people's power to transform the conditions of fragmentation, displacement, and loss of culture that result from histories of colonialism, patriarchy, genocide, and exploitation. I'm really pleased to welcome you both to Colgate. Um, just a quick uh, housekeeping, we'll be using the question and answer feature in Zoom uh, for you all to post questions for uh, Melanie and Jesus and Josh. And I will moderate that Q&A following. Um, and without further ado, uh, I give you Melanie, Jesus, and Josh. Thank you. Thanks to it. Um, and thanks to everyone at Colgate for helping put all this together. And this is the, the fourth of the um, this uh, spring series of graphic liberation conversations. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Brooklyn, New York, which is occupied Lenape Canarse land. And I'm very, very, very excited to be talking to my old friends, uh, Melanie and Jesus, who I haven't seen in a long time. So it's really nice to see them. Um, before we jump into that, I just want to say I'm, I'm um, also excited that we're continuing this series of conversations into the fall. And there's two that are already set up. Uh, for September, where we're doing a conversation with Daniel Drennan from the sort of diasporic but um, Beirut in heart based uh, graphics uh, and political art collective Jama Al Yad. And then in, uh, on November 3rd, I'm going to have a conversation with Tomia Arai, uh, who was part of Basement Workshop, which was the first Asian American sort of political cultural. Um, collective in New York City and does work, does did amazing mural work 
in New York City uh, in the 1970s and 80s, and now as part of a activist group called the Chinatown Art Brigade. So look forward to announcements about those two conversations. Um, and then uh, for tonight, we're going to follow the same basic format that uh, we've been following for the, the previous three, which is that I'm going to share my screen with a, a series of four images um, from uh, Dignidad or Belde, and then uh, Melanie and Jesus are going to sort of annotate them briefly to give us a sort of visual grounding in their practice. And then from there, we'll jump out and just have a uh, hopefully fun and free flowing conversation, which will go on, you know, till 545, 550, and then we'll open it up for questions uh, that show up in the Q&A uh, and chat functions. And then DeWitt will sort of moderate that and the three of us will, will handle all those questions. So um, let's, uh, let's jump right into it. Let me see if I can find, there we go. Cool. So can, can you all see this? So tell me about this image. So that's a piece that I did. It's um, the first piece that I did under the conditions of uh, COVID for which for me meant like I haven't stepped outside of my apartment except for the first dose of the vaccine. So over a year confined in the same space. And at the beginning of the um, shelter in place here, I was painting and I was trying to stay creative, but I really missed printmaking. And um, I had seen on social media, people who had used um, vinyl cutters or plotters to create vinyl stencils in order to screen print by making just basically sticker stencils. And so this piece was um, the second piece that I did is the first like multi-layer piece that I did. And I really um, was reflecting on this, um, the way that the media was um, sharing and portraying and, and I'd say both corporate media and then kind of like, you know, just the way people share, you know, these just belligerent people who would like totally have meltdowns, like I've seen children do in toy stores when they don't get a toy they want about wearing a mask, you know, and I was just having been um, isolated for so long, I just really was it, it, it's, I think, wholly strange already, but I really wanted to switch gears and look toward, well, what am I seeing in my community? And, you know, because what gets play is those meltdowns and just egregious, like, sense of not caring how other people are affected by one's actions. Um, but I wanted to, like, reflect on what I felt I saw in my community, the folks that I know, and it was this great sense of like interconnectedness, a sense of responsibility for each other. Um, there's a Mayan precept in Lakesh, which means like you are my other me. And so I, I created this portrait to show, I think too initially, you know, people couldn't access you know, the protective equipment, like you can't, there was like no N95 mask or, so people were using bandanas. So I just wanted to reflect the idea that community care was really central in a lot of the organizations and a lot of the communities that we're close to. And so that was what I decided to create and it was a bit of an experiment technically because I didn't know how to translate our printmaking process into this like new use of a <laughs> basically it's a, a cricket vinyl cutter you know like these machines are really geared towards I think like homemakers right they're they're in craft stores and 
you know, people make like mugs that say like happy 4th of July or they make Mother's Day gifts. And I was like, well, I want to do something different with it. I think it can still function you know, um, in the in a way that I can use it to make prints. And so this is the second edition. The first edition was a lot of troubleshooting on how to actually use, use it. And, and like we had to get screens with bigger mesh and all different kinds of like troubleshooting. But um, yeah, that's, that's the story of this piece is both kind of like marking this time and figuring out a way to pivot in the process. And then also just reflecting on what I was seeing that wasn't getting kind of airtime. Yeah. How about this one? Oh, wow. Um, that's a, a more recent piece. And um, it's been interesting because I think during this period, like Melanie said, you know, early on, I, I like switched over to doing, um, we didn't have access to our screen printing studio so I kind of switched over to doing different stuff and I started doing a lot of linoleums and and somehow or another my work became more inspirational I guess it was just a reflection of what was going on this is like last summer and so I think it was you know I, I never really did anything that addressed what was going on with COVID and more recently I think after I had my my first um my first dose of the vaccine I started to to really think of what was going on, and and for me it became like you know it's, it's this is a more recent piece I think I did in the last month, and I was thinking about you know what's happening right now. It, it, it's been sad to see that all of a sudden uh, we're we're going through another wave. It's funny on on SNL Saturday Night Live there was a, a skit about the fourth wave. Everybody just kind of having the fourth wave of of COVID um coming back on so to me it was kind of like I wanted to do something to address that because I see that a lot of people are all saying you know there's a vaccine and people are just kind of like cool we can go out and and everybody's you know starting to get sick so to me it was just kind of a reminder that we're still dealing with this we're still dealing with COVID it's like we're, we're still months away from like things being okay and people actually being able to go out and enjoying the something just because a few people have vaccines doesn't mean that everything's okay so to me it was kind of a piece about that but I went when you know thinking about COVID you know I think for a lot of us who who think about the politics behind <clears throat> everything that's going on now it was really you know it, it's bigger than COVID because COVID is like one of the symptoms of, of capitalism right and for for me it was really how do I make something that's addressing that I don't want to just you know think about COVID as the, the thing that we're dealing with as, as people right now, right? So to me, it was like, how do I, I really push something that's dealing with, with connecting these two, right? Because as we think about COVID, it's, you know, you go back to the spread, right? It, it, it started, there's, there's a lot of, you know, there's no real definitive answer to how it started, but like uh, the way a lot of these, these kind of epidemics are is because people are doing things um, to survive capitalism. And that is a way Ooh. of- it's moving not, around yeah moving around having to to go into into different places to uh find food sources and that has been one of the things that, that to claim and that's not i'm not trying to get into that but you know to me that you know i see that and and to me it's like capitalism is what drives it capitalism is what drives the spread of it capitalism has <clears throat> from the beginning been the thing that made people have to go to work and ended up getting people sick. It's been the thing that's driven people to say, we need to reopen, we need to reopen. Why? Because the government would rather reopen than put money into people's hands so they don't feel the need to have to go and work, right? So that these businesses have to reopen. Sorry, we had a, a tech a glitch right there. Um, but we, uh, you know, so it, to me, it's it's really about dealing with that. And so this is actually um, an, an image of, of a couple of my friends, uh, Isela and, and Barney, who are organizers in the community. So I think also, you know, just when thinking about it, it was really about how, um, how do I also kind of share the the workers who are doing the stuff in the community? I remember like Isela, when the uprisings were happening in Oakland, uh, she was someone who was out there and making sure that people stayed, stayed safe, that they had a place to get 
to use the bathroom, stay hydrated, to get masks if they didn't have them. And so to me, it was like working with that. And Barney's uh, an organizer who's been working around um, the criminal justice system and and doing work around that with uh, Courage Community Communities United to, for Restorative around restorative youth justice. And so to me, it was like also highlighting different people in the community. Yeah. And then this classic. That classic, yeah, that one came out, you know, last last year, I think it was um, when the uprising started. It, it's hard because as, as printmakers, as screen printers, we're always out there uh, making stuff and putting stuff into the world. And it was kind of hard to, to because of, of, you know, us, really trying to stay safe and Melanie trying to stay safe, not to go out and not to go to the studio, make prints to take out, to give away at all, uh, you know, what was going on in the streets. And so this was actually a piece that I made uh, that I designed to put online. And, and we had, Melanie had the idea of, of doing like a fundraiser. And so I made little digital prints uh, initially and, and little like five by seven digital prints and sold them online as a fundraiser. Initially it was for uh, Reclaim the Block and Black Visions. And we raised something like um, like $2,700 to, to be able to share with these organizations. And, and to me, it was a, a way of, of affirming this kind of connection between the Black Lives Matter movement and the Chicanx movement. Because I think to me, as it says, juntos somos poderosos, together we are powerful. It's, it's really about remembering that as, as people, we are are, are our liberation is tied in with each other's, right? So to me, it was really thinking about that black brown solidarity, which is actually the last piece as well. Um, that's been something that's really been really important during this time because uh, as we see, you know, we're both, as, as both of these communities are dealing with the same kind of issues and, and really all people of color communities in this country are dealing with these issues, right? But that was one of the things. And eventually, as Melanie was saying, when we got the, our, our cricket, uh, I was able to make some prints and I was able to do a, a fundraiser again uh, for Black Black Organizing Project and Courage again uh, to, to be able to, to give them some money to support the work that they're doing in the community. So to me, it's been, you know, this piece was really about kind of showing that solidarity and, and, and taking that solidarity to another level with, with the community to be able to, to do fundraising to help those organizations who are, are in this fight, you know, yeah. And then uh, I think this is the last, uh, the last one that Melanie sent over. Yeah, that's um, a piece that we did collaboratively. And um, it was for the museum in Long Beach, the Museum of Latin American Art. It was really interesting because for like decades, they didn't actually exhibit Chicanx art at all. It was all kind of like Latin American. It was a kind of a point of contention, you know, being in, in Southern California, where like that's a, that's the majority of brown folks out there. And so this was, I think, one of the first group exhibits um, that we, that they were hosting. And it was part of a project called Grafica America. And so, when we were invited to do this portfolio exchange, because there's like 29, I think, different um, dietes and artists that were invited, um, it was a pretty open call. And so we started talking about what do we want, what do we want to say? Like, what does Grafica America mean? It's like a really broad. And so we started talking about as Chicanx artists, what do we have that we can still hold on to, you know? We see ourselves as, um, you know, being Chicanx, we see ourselves as being indigenous in diaspora, right? Like um, I'm the first in many, many, many generations of women to be born off of the land that like my mom was born on. And so I have a very different experience than my mother my grandmother, her grandmother, her grandmother, you know, they all kind of lived in the same terrain. And so, um, in the conversation that Jesus and I had, it was really reflecting on like what is left for us. And a lot of it was food, right? Like when you look at it, it's like the corn, the nopales, um, the plants, the, aloe, the things that are so quotidian that are in our everyday lives that we just, it's like, oh, we just, it's just ours. 
but they come from um, very old ways of being in a relationship with what's on the land that you're from. And so um, this was a juxtaposition of those things by building an altar. Uh, and so this is a, actually based on a photograph of an altar that we built and um, photographed from like a second story. And the idea that um, naming is part of the colonial project. And so we just really kind of went into reclaiming um, the names of places and kind of rejecting and discarding some of the colonial names, which are, you know, inverted <laughs> um, and crossed out. Um, that's a little, I think like, I was thinking about like, you know, I did graffiti when I was in high school and, you know, there's a whole thing around like you would cross out other writers and it was a whole thing. Um, just occurred to me right now, but uh, yeah, so, so there's like kind of that rejection. And so um, this piece is called Bringing Back Ourselves. So it's both about how we, um, how we think about who we are and where we are, which I think, you know, we should also acknowledge that we're calling in from Halchis, the unceded territory of the Halquin Tocheno Loni, which is known as San Leandro. It's just east of Oakland, because people are always like, where's that if they're not from here? Cool. Let's let's just let's jump into this this conversation. Um, that's a lot to start with. And and I have a pile of questions. And as always, the, the difficult thing is figuring out which ones to ask. Um, so I, I guess I'll start with what I think is, I mean, for me, the thing that I've been continually impressed by and um, am always the most, like one of the things that seems so foundational to all the work that both of you do is um, the, the, the very um, intense level in which you embed all of your work into sort of overlapping senses of community whether that's Chicanx, uh, Latinx, or whether, I mean, also geographic. So the Bay Area. Um, and, and, you know, we, we've entered this period where both because of the explosion of social media, but then specifically because of COVID, um, more and more we function as to the outside world is these sort of disembodied heads in a way. Um, how have you struggled with maintaining this, this embeddedness in a context that's like literally pushing against that all the time? Um, like I'm really, I'm really interested in, in hearing from you about the ways that you, and you've talked a little bit, you talked about this in, in, in the, some of those pieces, those early um, pieces, but like, how do we how do we maintain and build our communities in these times that are where that's increasingly difficult, if not treacherous? So, um, I, I kind of mentioned, but for folks that are listening, um, in twenty seventeen, I was diagnosed with a really rare form of lung cancer. And in order to get that treated, I have to have surgery, like major surgery. And so that was, you know, and, and I talk, I, I talk lightly because that's how I feel. So I just thought about that other, um, you know, I kind of felt like it was a dress rehearsal for COVID. Like I had to be isolated because if I caught a cold, I could end up with pneumonia and in the hospital, like it could get very complicated from something fairly simple. And so I was for a good part of the year, very disconnected from a lot of our community connections in that way. And so I think um, entering into this um, period where all of a sudden, I think the world started to feel like what I felt, you know, the sense of isolation and, the challenge of not being able to do things you normally do, right? The word normal being <laughs> used quite a bit and, and having to learn how to adjust. 
um, I think it allowed me to pivot under COVID in a different way more quickly um, in some respects. It, it didn't make it any less difficult or challenging because, you know, like you said, like so much of what we do is relational. Like it's all built on relationships and trust and, um, and it hasn't been easy and it's been very difficult in fact. Um, but I think what I found, and I think it, it's like it happens in waves is that like anything, um, it's the long-term game, you know, like that we have been building relationships. I mean, not even building them, they're friendships. You know, a lot of the stuff is based on friendships and, you know, yes, they're kind of, we're political allies to folks, but I see it as deeper than that. Like we're friends with folks that are trying to change the world we live in. And, you know, these friendships are long-term. Like I know Jesus has friendships that are decades and decades long that started when folks were in college that like people have evolved in what they do and changed the different kinds of organizing they do, but like that friendship endures and the at the core of it, you know, it's like good folks with good hearts that are trying to make things better. And so because I think that's our orientation, um, it's not just about transactional relationships where we're like, oh, we're gonna do a poster with this group and then see you later. <laughs> um, it's, it's easier to like roll with the punches then. Um, it kind of shrinks some of the ways that we work with folks, you know, like we're able to like go, okay, well, how are we going to do this, you know, so one example is, um, you know, during the kind of post, well, I don't even know how to talk about it, um, after George Floyd was killed, you know, there was momentum to change things and locally there's an organization called the Black Organizing Project that had been organizing since Oscar Grant was killed here in Oakland, which is a, like 10 years before, to eliminate a police department within Oakland schools. Like the Oakland Unified School District had its own police department, like its own budget for its police department. And so they were finally getting traction to make it possible to actually do what they had been trying to do for a decade in this moment, you know, this flashpoint opened up an opportunity. And some of the teachers here in the um, Oakland Union asked if I could do a poster and, you know, so then we have all of the bumps in the road. We can't get into our studio. We're in a shared studio space that under normal conditions is like elbow to elbow, you know, because the reality of like gentrified Oakland is that it's impossible to have abundant space anymore. You know, we, we've, we every time we're displaced from a space, we get tighter and tighter, so sardines in a can. And so under the conditions of COVID it's impossible. So there it was just like, we had to figure out how to do a relay race. It's like, okay, I, I can design it, but then we'll pass it on to folks that can actually have the access to the studio. And then, you know, and it was, it was that. And it was wonderful because um, one of the strategies here that's been used a lot are these car caravans. And that's like, instead of doing marches, <laughs> there's these car caravans. And so they had posters outside the cars, which was wonderful because all the car caravans, that's what I kept thinking. I was like, I wish we could make posters because we could actually um, support folks that way. Um, and it was so great because it's like, again, this the person that reached out is someone that I've known for a long time. And, um, and the, you know, so there's, I think, already an established trust. And for me, that was the spark that made me go, we, I have to figure out how we can screen print in our house. You know, that the desire to want to help more because of that call to help in some way. Um, you know, that it, it isn't just like one way, like them asking for help, it actually sparked something really amazing. Um, because I think trying to solve that problem has actually helped us figure out how to do something more with organizations. And we could talk about that later. Um, so it, yeah, it's been hard, but um, 
we're trying to figure it out. And, you know, with other organizations, it's like, yeah, like another organization that's working on uh, the citywide defunding of OPD, um, like they asked for a poster and, you know, we went through this whole conversation. It's like, oh, can we get a screen? And then they're like, oh, wait, we didn't really think through that might not be COVID safe to do like a screen where people can print and they're like touching all the same stuff and breathing in each other's faces. And so it's just, but again, it's with folks that I've known for a long time and that we can have, you know, a level of conversation where it doesn't feel like we're just trying to get to the thing. It's actually much deeper than that. I mean, I think the other thing that was really cool was that Melanie early on started like kind of going back to old school mail art. That was another thing that I think was just really cool. Like kind of, uh, I think within the first couple of months, we have all these postcards that we that we make. And at some point we started making, I started making little linoleum prints and we would just send out, like we would take kind of uh, addresses through Instagram and kind of open it up to the first 20 people that would like hit us up, would get like a, a, a little piece in the mail. So I think to me, it's been like, it, it's been a, a challenge of like, how do we do all this? And, you know, from like Mel what Melanie was saying, sometimes it was like making a design and have, handing it off to someone who, who could go into the studio, have them print it, end up on cars. Some of it was like making prints to send out around the country through the mail. And I think that was, you know, to me, it's, it's been interesting because it's shown you know what we can do and it's it's shown that although there's a lot of limitations it's we we can do stuff yeah that mail project was actually the one of the main things i did right away you know actually i really was like cursing these postcards because we had so many postcards because no one uses them like we did we we just had boxes full of them and i was like oh thank god that maybe like i can give these out and you know, they can go out in the world instead of sitting in a box in our spare bedroom. And the cool thing was then like other people started their own little initiatives. And it was, for me, it was a sense of like, I know the desperation people are feeling. Like I said, I feel like I had a dress rehearsal, like this isolation that starts to happen is really hard psychologically. And so I'd send out like quotes from, you know, people in history, just a little bit of encouragement. And, you know, I might focus it different, you know, send this out to someone who's called an essential worker or send this out to a teacher, whatever, you know, like a healthcare worker. And it was just something I could do every day that could help us feel connected beyond social, you know, like social media, I think it's fleeting, but I think taking the time to handwrite a card, you know, my grandma knew that <laughs> and she sent me like, and I remember what it felt like to get mail from like my aunts. And, and I was like, you know, I'm in the generation that still experienced that. So I was like, well, something simple, it's a small act, but then it just kind of started multiplying and that was kind of a nice little experiment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it was clear that people, well, one, looking from afar, the, those, those calls on Instagram for, for postcards like it was like seconds later you know 20 people had asked for them i mean they were just like immediate the the popularity um but i, I mean it, it seems like that just dovetailed into a whole larger not your your postcard campaign but people's desire to have something a, a gift kind of delivered to them mm -hmm. just fed into like the whole explosion of online shopping that kind of came out of COVID as well which of course had its pros, which people could get stuff, but then also its cons with the sort of like now, you know, Amazon's that much closer to choking us on our planet. Um, but but um, I guess, I mean, I wanna talk more about that, but I also wanna look at this from a different angle um, because I know like right now, like literally right now there's this, probably one of the biggest, um, if not the biggest exhibition in the US on the history of Chicano printmaking is at the Smithsonian, um, Printing the Revolution. And you're both included in it. And, 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 and I was thinking about this and, and there's this beautiful catalog that's you know 400 massive full color pages and, and um, 
And I was thinking about the, the conversation that I had with, with Avram Finkelstein. There it is. <laughs> um, Zapata under his mustache. Uh, um, the, the conversation I had with, with Avram Finkelstein in, in which he, he was, you know, very, very um, critical of and suspicious of the role the, that institutions play um, in the kind of collecting and redisplaying of material that comes out of movements. And, you know, he was speaking about that from the context of ACT UP. Um, but I, I was really interested in how you all felt about um, the kind of new institutionalization of, of this work and how it relates to these questions of being grounded in, in communities. I don't know. It's weird because we, you know, I. It, it's like a double-edged sword, always, right? It's like we're we're in these places, but then it's like we, you know, yeah, like what what happens when you have this work in these places? The other, to me, the other side of it is the way that I became an artist, and the way, like, it all goes back to like whatever, what I, what whatever I am today. It always go. I always think of it as going back to when my sister brought home. Um, she went away to college and she would bring all her books back to me and I would somehow get inspired to be a Chicano. And one of the books that she brought back was an exhibition catalog to the Chicano Art Resistance and Affirmation exhibit that happened in the, I think like 89, 90. And she was using it in one of her classes, probably were one of Chicano studies classes. And that's the way I found art. Like I was just like, wow, this is freaking amazing. This is like all of these things, how I found Rupert's work, I found Juan's work, Esther's work. And, and so I look back to that. And, and that was the, you know, the first, first real exhibit that brought all of these artists from the Chicano Chicana art movement from the 60s and 70s together into an institution. And on one hand, it was like amazing because it was like, so you have the, these spaces like the Hammer Museum at UCLA, that was bringing all these artists together, showing their work, showing their legacies, highlighting their work, you know, 20 or so years after it was created, bringing up new work, uh, installations there. And, and so it, it was this, this great thing to see. But then what happens, you know, it leaves people out. It, it, it does all these things that, that then you kind of, we look back as art historians now and like, so this is what really went down. This, these are the problems with it, but it's, I don't know, it's as now then, it becomes like there's there's multiple issues to it because we're looking at, at these collections that that get exhibited and we're thinking about it, it's it becomes this thing where it's like okay so this is where the the real scholarship around the arts coming out so that's the other positive side is that you have this book the print the printing the Rev, printing the revolution right all of a sudden we have another book that um, has a few essays uh, about Chicano, Chicana, Chicanx art. And it's like, okay, so it's been like since the last one, the last big exhibition catalog that came out that we had these, these, these pieces that come out that talk about this work, right? So it's like, to me, it's like, there's all these things that are positive, but at the same time, they're negative because we don't have any, any real scholarship around uh, in, in terms of art history around Chicanx art. So it's like, we're looking at the positive side. It's like, it exposes a world to it. Um, it creates these little bursts of, of academic scholarship that comes out of it. But we're, but then once you kind of, once the exhibition goes down, what happens? We don't have any more books that come out about it. And and to me, it's like, it's great to have this work hanging in, in these places, but you know what, I don't know. It's always like, what, you know, what does it mean to put this work up and does it depoliticize it? I think that's always been the question. Does it take away its meaning? and it's like this one thing, but then it's like kind of the going back and forth for me of like, but it's at the same time, it's like, you know, now with the um, Smithsonian being closed, I think it was open for like three days for the exhibition. And then it just became, a, I don't know, one day I think it'll become a virtual tour. Um, but with these exhibitions, it's like it allows people to, to go in and to see it and to be exposed to it. But then, you know, it's like, I feel like it's going back and forth between it's good, it's bad, it's good, it's bad. And that's, and what, what it comes down to is that like I think like what I was getting at with uh, the scholarship is that we just don't have enough exposure to the world of the work that we're talking about. And so this is a real issue with the art world. That's a, you know, and, and it sucks because 
it, it, the, the, one of the conversations that Melanie and I not always have is like, what does it mean for us to be involved in the art world? What does it mean to have our work hanging at places like the Smithsonian, at the LACMA, uh, at the De Young, at the MoMA here in San Francisco? Is it good? Is it bad? You know, is it, is it good because then it exposes people to it, but then is it bad because then we're always kind of thinking around the limitations of it. And what does it mean to have these old posters? And for a long time, it was like these exhibitions, going back to the Kara one, it was like, okay, we're, we're, going to, we're going to now 30 years later, 40 years later, 50 years later, we're gonna look at all this work that was created uh, 50 years ago about politics that are, I don't wanna say that they're no longer relevant, but aren't of the time. So we're looking back at work that was created um, a long time ago around politics that, you know, not that aren't relevant today, but are, are, are different, right? And, and they'll always include things that were going on and they won't include Manakia's poster about uh, police killings of, of brown kids in, in Fruitvale, right? Because that's too, too much, yeah. too close to this today, right? So, but they'll include the, the cool um, celebration posters that Malakias would do. That's just an example, right? And so we're, we're thinking about how it's okay nowadays to have like the, the good stuff that shows the the radical politics of the 1960s and 70s it's but they're all selective it's very right? selective and, and we, we yeah. argue a little bit because i think i'm more ambivalent about the institutionalization or worse than ambivalent i kind of like it i don't know i make a poo poo face <laughs> put it that way um i just i don't know you know that it's it's i guess it's good to be included and you know the piece that i had included included in the exhibit wasn't a movement piece the you know they got two pieces and one one of them is and it, and it wasn't included so there's that too <laughs> but i think um you know i think a lot about the fact you know part of the reason that we like doing printing is because the multiple allows for the work to exist in many places at once Right, and it, it, I, the way I talk about it is that these pieces get to have lives of their own. You know, um, there's one poster I did in 2011 after um, uh, the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt, and you know, the same poster that was handmade, you know, was being carried by women in code pink on the San Francisco Bridge, but it also was carried by like a young Chicanx organizer that went to Cairo on the year anniversary after Mubarak had been ousted. And he's like, look, you know, the, the youth movement here is alive and well, like solidarity is like this really dark picture that they sent me and tagged me on social media. Otherwise, I would have never known. But then there was also like the PDF that I uploaded that was downloaded by organizers in Bangkok and printed out at some print shop there that got used outside of the Egyptian Cairo and I mean the Egyptian embassy in Cairo. So like that's one example had so many lives and you know that piece could also end up in an institution. And so um, I don't think it has, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I, I think for me, sometimes I'm like, well, that's not always necessarily the place that I'm aiming to get it to, you know, some of those other stories, those to me are, are the triumphs because who holds it is what makes it meaningful to me. Like how, how it's, how it lives is, is what makes it meaningful to me. So I think for me, the way that I kind of reconcile that ambivalence is that, you know, well, um, it doesn't, I don't feel like it doesn't lose its power in the streets because it's in that institution because I'm not because there are artists that only that make that kind of work with the themes that only aim for the institution. But I think because of what we're trying to do, um, we have a lot of different uh, places we're trying to go right like I was rewriting, I'm like trying, I hate writing because I have a lot of like insecurities about it. And I was like trying to rewrite like a section of like my bio. And I was like trying, because you know, there's like a standard form in the art world, like, you know, list these things, list, list the institutions that you're 
your art ends up at. And then I was like trying to write like, and I've had work up in the streets and not in the like street art, trying to get in the fine art kind of thing, but like to try to say like, to me, these are important. And if not even equally important, you know, the last one's even more important to me. You know, the fact that the people that we depict, you know, when we're working with a domestic workers organization, for me, when those domestic workers come up to us and it's meaningful to them and they, you know, like there's one <laughs> organizer, her name's Yermina and she always comes up to us and just, um, there's just this exchange. Like she feels like an auntie in some ways, you know, <laughs> like there's just this encouragement and we see each other in this way that that makes me feel like those fleeting moments. I'm like, that's what I'm trying to do. And I don't know if anything that I ever do like with that organization will ever make it into any institution or not, but that's not my primary concern. It's kind of like, for me, um, it's a secondary um, place where we can maybe get it in front of some eyes and, and like, you know, I think a lot about like what Jesus kind of says about his experience of being a child. And, you know, it's true. Like that's where you get taken on field trips that I did also went on those field trips, you know, in school. So um, I try to hold that as well. And then there's the other side of it is what does it mean to have like, to, to kind of continue on the, on the path of the, uh, the work that we've done with like Mujeres Unidas and the domestic workers here in California. And like, what, what would it mean to have those works hanging in places like the MoMA or to have, because our work is always reflecting the people who are in the streets who are doing the organizing. So what does it mean to have those people images hanging in these institutions? And it, it's kind of like that, like that, that, like I said, it's always a double-edged sword. It's that that's amazing, but it's also, what does, how does that, what does that do to the movements? Yeah. Does it amplify them? Does it, um, I don't that's know, a good example because like yeah. right now they had a bill about getting protections for, for workers mm -hmm. in the homes, right? And the governor vetoed the bill, Newsom vetoed the bill. And so it's what it went through the Senate and got approved. And so like we're, you know, they're in this second cycle of organizing. So like if that that for example, like that'd be great if it made into an institution, but it means jack crap if they can't pass that policy, yeah. right? Because if I think within this, and this is all made up, right? Within that context. It's, you know, usually wealthy people that have people that work in the domestic sphere, right, that have the capital to pay someone to be either like a nanny to kids or, you know, they're cleaning houses or they're doing elder care. Um, like those are a lot of people that have the, like museum memberships, right? Those are the people that or, or that are donors yeah. to those institutions. So, yeah, I think that that's a good example made up of like that kind of friction in terms of movement and yeah. and I and think work. the other thing that I'm kind of thinking about you know something like we have printing the revolution which is a Ch Chicanx Latinx show um at the Smithsonian that's very you know ethnic ethnically based which is problematic there's a whole other conversation we can get into that about just lumping all brown people together and say like hey this is this is the shit brown people make um that's political but then we're looking at something that's happened in the last decade. You know, I think within the art world, we have these, these periods, right? And I think we look back to the 90s and the 90s were definitely the, the multicultural period. It was a, the moment where brown people were allowed, you know, brown, black, yellow people were allowed to come into these museums. Yeah, we have like, it, it, like there was, you know, the, the, the Whitney show in 92, 93, right? It was like, that was a big deal. And, and so to me, there's that, and you know, all of a sudden, in the, in the period after that, and the, you know, becomes like, oh, it's like, wow, well, why are you still talking about identity? That was, you know, we did that already. <laughs> and then it's like, yeah, and, and so there's that, and then there's the the more recent period where all of a sudden, I think, you know, we're looking back to the Occupy moment, and in the, the period after the Occupy moment, it seemed because it was so important culturally that we had these big institutions that were all of a sudden because they needed to stay relevant. We're like, we need to show some political posters. <laughs> we need to show some political work and all of a sudden artists in the art world are, are following the trend and all of a sudden you have the artists who are making political work it's it's okay to be political again i was you know in, in my mfa program around that time and so it was okay to be political it was encouraged to be political we were talking about marxism and, and capitalism uh never really getting to to talking about it 
but we're talking about it. You know, it's always like that. And so now, you know, you're seeing, you know, what's the deal with, you know, with institutions who are then all of a sudden having street art shows and political street <laughs> art shows, right? And and are like, we want to have the work that's in, in the streets. And to me, I think that's great. And it, it says a lot, but it's also, you know, it's like this, this, what does it mean? Is that being co-opted? Is it great? Is it bad? I don't even know anymore. It's like the, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's so complicated. We're like kind of always trying to figure out what, what's, what's the intentions behind it. Is it bad? Is it good? And there's always the role of capital, which yeah. I think, you know, when you're really. Yeah. Well, I think we, yeah, that's, that's, it seems like the big, one of the big parts of these two edges is, right. is representation very easily gets manipulated so that the appearance of something somewhere gives the impression that there's been change. So right. there's a change on the in the flat field of the wall, but then and, so, and then people walk away with the idea that somehow that's changed in the embodied three dimensional world we live in, which of course it hasn't, and and that that sort of slippage happens all the time. I mean, I could. And it's not just museums. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's, right? it's it's everything. But I I could see I can see that with the example of the domestic workers, how people could go into a museum and see those women on the wall and be like, oh, this shows how much it's changed. Um, and if it doesn't actually engage those people in the mechanisms that are moving to pass those bills then in, in fact, it could actually people turn people away from it and be like, why do we even have to think about this anymore? I just saw it in, in a museum, it's done. Right. Um, so there is, I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it's such a huge, huge issue. And, and this gets into another big question, which has been part of all of the conversations, um, which I'm, I'm really interested in what, what you all have to say about it, because I know you've thought a lot about it, which is this, if we're, if we're talking about, these images and, and these images getting distributed through prints you make, through institutions, through social media, through PDF download, it gets into these really thorny and interesting questions about who owns these images, who gets to use them, how do they get to use them, what are the permissions necessary for that use? Um, you know, what what um what are your thoughts on these the sort of questions of simultaneously like celebrating the use of of images in movement work but also you know feeling i mean fe either feeling or not feeling the need to somehow also control the uses in other contexts right yeah i mean i think we're big fans of like um copy left and um creative commons you know um and you know love Personally, I think we're huge, huge fans of folks like Rainey Templeton, who was really ahead of her time in creating her Xerox art and really kind of getting it out for people to use as needed in movement. Um, and I think that's, I think the spirit of how we work. I mean, I think for us, a lot of the times, the line is definitely around like corporate exploitation of images, you know, we've never had, as far as I know, um, you know, a Walmart, you know, because th that's, I've seen that a lot, like where people like, whoever works for Walmart will wholesale, like take an image from social media, and then they create like a piece that's sold on their site, as an example. Um, and, you know, folks remix stuff. I think, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, I guess I, there's some things like, where there's times where remixing works and then there's times where I'm like that totally like changed what I was making like it um so I don't know I think um there's also kind of you know we had this conversation because I think generationally when we talk to like some of the artists that really created a lot of the um movement that we step into in, in terms of like um politically engaged graphics like they didn't deal with all of the different ways that it could be so quickly moved and and there's a lot of grumpiness around like oh you know trying to control mm -hmm. and i was like you know there's moments where i was like yeah that's gonna be impossible to control <laughs> now you know like we live in an age where 
um, you know, I won't name some of the artists that I'm thinking of, but you know, I was like, yeah, you know, where they were like upset, like saying that's not the right politic that in the context, I was like, well, that's gonna be really hard to control now. Um, so I think there are certain things that for me, I'm just like, I'm not, to a certain extent, it's gonna live beyond what I am even aware of. Um, and, you know, then there's also been interesting, I think folks younger than us that are like pretty good, like I've seen on social media where people are like, you know, make sure you're at least crediting where you got it from. And, and I think it's a lot of around acknowledgement, which I think is interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm getting at what you no, were no. trying to, to me as, as someone who comes out of like, you know, I, I came came of age during the beginning of the internet and I was part of the Napster generation where we just downloaded music <laughs> yes. and you know there was like Metallica who was like no we got to control that you you know this and that and <laughs> to me like it's like I don't say this very often but fuck dude people use whatever you want like to me I think that's like I can I can never like really I feel like I never really have a have the kind of um thinking that's like why you know why everybody should attribute everything like i because I've, I've been part of that generation that just would download music and it was cool and then i would delete it or I'd put on my i on my on my, on my uh, mp3 cd player um uh, <laughs> back in the day so like the other day i saw like there's someone who like took one of my images and and had it on on the cover of a zine and i was looking at it and i was like does it have like any any like attribution to me and it, it did it and i was like for a moment i was just like that to me, it's like, there's on the other end, there's like, it's kind of cool that my work is, is just so, so out there that like this person that knows me doesn't even know that I created that image because they're young and it's, God, they were probably little kids when I made that image, um, which is kind of weird and on another end, but You're old. I'm old and it's like, yeah, it's like the work, like to me, it's like, you know, for the most part, the work is not going to end up on, um, on the army's website, on Coke's website. So I'm like, to me, as long as it yeah. doesn't end up there, it's cool. On the other hand, like it's funny because there was a, a, a painter and they had this this Day of the Dead painting um, that got taken by some some uh, company in China, some like uh -oh. unnamed company in China. And they basically created like a, a wall decoration out of it that's like four by five feet and are selling them on, Ali, on AliExpress for like 20 bucks. And it's like, I was like, the artists had seen it somewhere and they were like, I can't believe they did this. And I was like, dude, did you know that this is on AliExpress? And, and he was just like, man, this is horrible. Like for an artist who's making a painting and, and it was already sold in someone's collection or something, but it was like, you know, this is, I think to me, it's like, there's these things that it's like, in today's world, it's not even just like, well, you know, will the work get like subverted by a corporation? Is it will even just get subverted by <clears throat> these little bootleggers like I think early on like the the most of the work that I've had bootlegged is like in in Russia where they were doing those weird t-shirt um one-off printer things where you yeah. know they would they would make money by I think this happened a lot during the the height of the um standing rock movement yeah. where like there was like these these companies that were just basically creating these Native American pages where they would sell all this stuff and so to me it's like we're having all of these conversations with technology today as Melanie was saying you know people who don't want to have you know a, a website because they don't want their work out there because then it could get <laughs> co-opted but it's not even the co-opting it's like like I, I guess it's it's almost what I get, I guess I'm getting at it's, it's unlimited of what can happen to these graphic right. images once they're out there on the web you know they could you know well I mean the commodification and I know Emery brought up the whole thing with the NFTs I think that's like the height right oh yeah, yeah. the height of commodification which is it's so surreal to me and weird I'm like wow like a thing that's not even a thing well, is being sold yeah. It's it's um it's six o'clock and so we're we're gonna have to jump to the Q and A but I I so wanted to dovetail this into this question I've been wanting to ask you for a long time and that really gets into some of this larger project that I'm interested in which is about your use of patterns mm -hmm. um, because I've been thinking a lot about political graphics in a way as a language and as a sort of folk tradition even though it's not geographically located like we think of most folk traditions but the way that Posada's work or the Russian constructivists or May 68, the way that politicized activists and organizer, artists and designers have used and repurposed and reused that work, almost it functions like an alphabet in a way. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, like Frank. And there's so much to 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 go into there, and I would so interested in your question, your uh, take on that. But I think we should go to the Q and A just to to give some some other people some some time. Sure. Uh, thank you. That was fascinating. <clears throat> so um, I'm just going to jump right in. There's a there's a question from Magnus um, uh, who who asks: is, is it possible to start your own institution, a new? institution or should we abandon institutions altogether? Is the institution just distorted by capitalism? Is it better just to recreate? I mean, I think they kind of point to the question, we got to get rid of capitalism first, right? Everything everything is mired by capitalism, right? I'll, I'll, I, I'd say like uh, under capitalism, everything gets skewed because I, th I was thinking of what Jesus was saying, you know, it's really we were talking about the commodification of people's work, right? Like the, where things just constantly get commodified to this um, atom. So I think, I don't think it's the institutions in and of themselves that are the problem, at least I think. I think it's the way that capitalism um, really distorts how we function. Because, you know, you can look at other models like Cuba, right? They have institutions that work, but they're under a different economic model, right? So, so to yeah. me, I think that, I mean the, that's what I would. The thing is, like, I, yeah, I mean, I think institutions are important because we look back to the '70s, and and during the '70s in California, we had all of these cultural centers that were created, and so to me, I think one quick story is when Rene Yanez um, passed away a few years ago. Rest in peace, brother. Uh, but he. Uh, in, in a trip to Mexico, he, he came back with all these posters of Frida Kahlo, and this is in the, in the mid 70s. Uh, and he went to the SF, uh, SF MoMA and he was like, hey, how about an exhibition of this, of this kind of work? Um, and they were like, no, capitalism right here. They said, no, we don't have the audience for that. We can't make money off of that. We don't have the audience for that. And what ends up happening is, okay, whatever, you know, they go back to the Galeria La Raza and the Mission and they have a, a Frida Kahlo exhibit. You know, probably one of the first Frida Kahlo exhibits. It's huge. It's it's one this is in it, the seventies. In the seventies, right? mid seventies, this is iconic of, of the time, right? It was one of uh, Rupert Garcia's first Frida Kahlo posters. All this other work that comes out, and you know, then you jump, you know, jump. You know, was it like forty years into the future. The Frida Kahlo exhibition at the SF MoMA is one of the biggest hits, right? It's one of their biggest exhibitions to date. Made them the most money, of course, capitalism, right? And so it's like, yeah, it's like it, it only it's only important for them when they make money. But for these institutions in the 70s, it was important for them to share the work and bring it into the community. And that's what it was about. So, yeah, it's important for us to have our our institutions that are able to, to do that. So you have like in New York, you have Museo del Barrio with a really important exhibition right now on, on Latinx art. And they called them alternative spaces or oppositional spaces. Yeah. And there's the real history that you can point to in how they were um, destroyed, yeah. you know, both by federal funding and the withholding or the threat of, of withholding funds and the way it kind of caused friction between people because of resources, because constantly institutions, individuals were always trying to the conservative 80s. Yeah, we're trying to keep yeah. our head above water because of capitalism. Yeah, I mean, I've always come at this question from the from the margins of like, well, yeah, create your own institutions. And it's like, these things happened in the seventies, but then you, you get into these questions of how do you, how do you maintain those institutions? And so I've been thinking more and more about what if you came at it from both directions? Like, what if we made demands on these larger institutions to not function like corporations that had to find the most mass audience? Like imagine if the Smithsonian collection was broken up into a thousand smaller collections that went into a thousand different cities around the country in which the communities in those cities had some say in how that work was displayed and i mean that would have so much more impact than Absolutely. having forcing everyone into dc i mean there, there's we don't maybe don't make enough demands on these these institutions while doing our own thing on the side yeah interesting uh, we have another one from, uh, we've got a, 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 an attendee from London, um, protest stencil. I wonder if you could chat a little bit about what you think about your work and international solidarity, how you draw connections between anti-colonial and indigenous struggles worldwide. Thank you for your work. 
I mean, to me, it's just like I'll, I'll go back, you know, to to the early work that I was doing in terms of like international struggle was really around Palestine, and for me, it was. You know, there's the classic, you know, my liberation is bound up in your liberation, right? And so to me, when when thinking about Palestine, it was like, these are the same issues that as indig- as an indigenous person from the Americas, my people have been dealing with here. So it's, it's important for me to be in solidarity with people in Palestine, because their work that they're doing is is just as important to, to my liberation as my work here is important to their liberation. So to me, it's always about how do I see myself connected to these people around the world whose work I'm doing work I'm, I'm making like a connection with and thinking about you know what's happening right now like I think Melanie made a poster about what's the name of the spot the um, Melmar oh, Myanmar Myanmar yeah. and then you know thinking about what's you know it's like there's almost not enough time to do that I wanted to I've been wanting to make something around what's happening in India with the farm workers you know it goes to like thinking about the Zapatistas it thinks it goes around, you know, thinking about what's happening and throughout Africa. So it's like almost there's not not enough time to make all that work, but there's just all of this importance. I mean, for me, I think particularly in the time that we're living in, you know, like um, I grew up in Southern California and I think about looking at um, Malakias Montoya's poster really kind of critiquing the Vietnam War, but doing it through the lens of solidarity between Chicanos and and the Vietnamese, right? And I'm like, you know, the age that I am, a, a lot of the refugees that came from Vietnam, those were the students I went to school with, right? Like, and, you know, I was in ESL, you know, coming into school. So like, there was like the lived experience that makes me understand now as an adult, like there is a relationship to what's happening. You know, Vietnam's pretty far away, right? But there's a relationship to what is happening in other parts of the world where I'm standing, right? And being a US citizen, like there's a responsibility in really calling out its imperialist actions. And so I think, you know, whether I'm a person of color or not, I'm still a citizen of the United States. And and as such, I feel like there are privileges that I have, you know, having a US passport when we travel, like it makes it different for us in a lot of different ways. And we've seen it and experienced it. And so for me, I think understanding again, like from a worldview that understands that you are my other me you know, that sense of interconnectedness, that um, pointing to um, the struggles that are happening in other places, you know, that there's a relationship there, that it's not just that it's easier to talk about problems in other parts of the world instead of looking at what's happening, but to understand that they're intrinsically linked, that, um, In fact, you know, there's really kind of concrete things like we were part of organizing efforts here um, around um, this policing mechanism, this kind of like trade show for um, repression, really. Um, uh, We were part of this group called Stop the Injunction. I'm sorry, not Stop the Injunctions, the, I always mess up the the name, the um, Stop Urban Shield, sorry. And so, Um, A good example is like these policing tactics that are used all over the world, you know, people come from Israel to Alameda County, and they work with Morton County sheriffs who end up arresting Standing Rock water protectors, and that, you know, they have trainings about like how they will um, function in implementing those arrests in Oakland, you know, like those that's very concrete, the repressive, you know, but that's just like one example. Um, there's many, many examples of how our fates are tied together in that way. And so for me, understanding that, I think we have to have strategies on the, in the little kind of space that we occupy in, in the graphic works that are just as complex and multifaceted. Yeah. Um, I just want to finish up with one final question. Um, uh, 
from the very beginning of your talk, uh, uh, Natalie uh, said she loved the idea of understanding an old way of being in relationship with the food from the lands we come from. She saw, found it super poetic and I feel like the art puts images to the things that feel like home. And, you know, I'm struck by in, in, in all the things you've been saying about interconnectedness and this idea of, um, you know, this notion of home or these, these signifiers, right? Things that sort of say something about us and where we've come from, um, what home means. I, I think that's always, the food's interesting. I, when I was young, when I was college, I was like, or 20 years ago, I was talking with a, with a scholar, Ada Sosa Riddell, and talking to her about indigen, indigeneity. For me, it was about, you know, reclaim this, reclaim that. I was just so gung-ho. She was like, you know, when you think about it, it all goes back to food, you know? And I was just like, that's not what I wanted to hear. But it was it made sense. It was like, yeah, it's like it all goes back to food. Like for, for us, when we think about it as a Chicanx person and, you know, I'm, I'm still eating tortillas, I'm still eating nopales, I'm still eating tamales. I'm, I'm, I'm partaking in these things that my people here in the Americas have been eating for like thousands of years. And I think there's that that's one of those things that kind of gets, as Melanie was saying, you know, in the explanation of that, it's just these things that have stayed with us. That's kind of a resistance, you know, it's so silly that every time you eat a tortilla, it's a sense of resistance, right? But it's like this thing is like you maintain who you are, you maintain that corn culture as, as uh, Roberto Cindy Rodriguez talks about it, that maize culture, that corn culture that has spanned, you know, thousands of years. And that's how we keep it alive. It is by continuing to pass those foods on. And, and yeah, it's interesting. I'm and I think, I mean, when we talk about indigeneity and indigenous sovereignty, like Land, land, when we talk about decoloniality and decolonization, land has to be part of the conversation or it's not actually an accurate um, depiction of what decoloniality is. And food, you know, food, it comes from specific places, right? Like there's certain animals and, you know, they, they all come from place. And no matter where you go in the world, when you're talking to indigenous cultures, the sense of being and what it means to be a human being is in relation to and food and the relationship to the land like that I think is the most easy way to understand um, who we are right as human beings because most most indigenous cultures in their original languages you know they more or less translate to like people of the earth people of that land and so to me, like when we were doing that piece in particular, but um, generally as we are living in the world, um, that was a good place to start to understand ourselves. Because if we don't understand ourselves, then I don't think we really are gonna understand our place in struggle. That's very, very well said. Well, I wanna thank you again and uh, thanks everybody for attending. Um, a wonderful conversation and thank you Josh again for putting together this series this spring and we really look forward to um, the future of uh, your residency with us and further conversations about the way in which art can be meaningful and uh, impactful in the world around us. Thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks you guys.